We're with uh, Bill Betridge, Queen's Own Rifles, uh, three days before the 64th anniversary of D-Day. Bill is a D-Day survivor, was one of those who managed to last the entire war, I guess, in, uh, after D-Day. Bill, Bill, let me ask you a bit about where you, where you were born, where you, where you lived. I was born in Brampton, Ontario, May the 6th. That's the day we got the ceasefire. That's right. the day I come in from a night patrol. And the rumors of the war being over, I'd been on a night patrol with an Indian I had in my platoon. He was a very dark-skinned Indian. When I had to blacken my face up, he started to laugh because he's already black. Right? <laughs> and he had beautiful white teeth. And I said, one of these days you're going to show them white teeth once too often. You're going to get one there. So one of us hit a tripwire on the, on the way out. <laughs> the sky lit up. <clears throat> we got back out of that. And coming back, I said to the corporal, I was a sergeant at the time, I said to the corporal, I said, don't any of you guys wake the chief. I called this Indian fellow the chief, unless the war's over. So he didn't hardly get to, to bed, getting daylight now. The war's over, the war's over. I said, well, tell everybody to stay in their hole because the Germans may not know the war's over yet. There's a few people killed right after the ceasefire. That's right. The official yeah. ceasefire was later, but that's the day we got the ceasefire. It was on my birthday, May the 6th. Next. Really? Really? Yeah. But you went through the whole war. Were you wounded at any time, injured at no, any time? just the usual close shaves. I had two trenches caved in on me, uh, enough dirt to absorb the shrapnel, but the blast affected my eyes and ears. That's one reason. I haven't got a hearing aid on today, so I'm having a little trouble hearing sometimes. Okay, well, but, uh, no, there was, uh, you know, D Dick Medlin was a company commander. This is a, a scary one. Snipers, we use like a paratrooper's coat, a lot of pockets in it, but not all the hardware, because the, the, the infantrymen had the big square pouches to hold Bren guns, uh, magazines. Mm -hmm. We just used them flat once, hold about 40 rounds of ammunition, and carried a bandolier hanging over the back. So anyway, we're, we're <coughs> at this incident I want to get to, this could be a whole hour to tell you this from start to finish, but this part, we're advancing down, the company commander and his radio, and myself and Bert Shepard, who was my sniping partner. And I was a point man this day, and we're going down a long field which sloped, and at the bottom of the slope was like a country road, the railway tracks on our right, and then after that, the ground sloped up about the same distance. So part way down there, we come under fire, we had a shovel. <clears throat> we had a shovel to ready to dig in when we got to where we wanted to go. And the bullets were flying all over the place. So there was a lot of grass that we could keep hidden from view, except for our radio man. I remember metal and say, "Tommy, get rid of that damn radio, because it's the antenna sticking up, and drawing fire." Eh? Even though the fire was coming, I'd say six or seven hundred yards away. So. Uh, I could. I got sick of listening to these bullets flying around, and I thought, geez, if I just run towards the enemy, about 50 yards to get to that little country road, you know, like every country road, lots of trees and bushes and weeds and all that, and the outside furrow of every field's got a little trench, and I thought, geez, I'd get into that. So anyway, I made a dash for it, and my binocular case come loose. So I had to drop the shovel, or the rifle, I'm not going to drop the rifle, so I dropped the shovel and held the rifle in one hand, hold the binocular case from falling away till I got to that little road. Well, it wasn't long before I could see the outside furrow of the plow wasn't big enough to conceal my body, so I got my Camaro knife trying to make it deeper, and I heard a kabang. It's a mortar bomb on my right. And then I heard another kabang, and they're starting, they don't know exactly where I am, so they're starting to drop mortar bombs all along the hedgerow, and I looked across the road. If I ran a towards the enemy across the road, I'd seen a German trench there, a slip trench. I thought, if I get into that, so I went flying across the road and got into that slip trench, and then mortar bombs come right along the hedgerow, right behind me, all the way down. But that way is, when I got into the trench, now I'm able to shoot back for once. And I'm examining my binocular case. In my binocular case, I kept two grenades because we don't have all that stuff to hook grenades on. And the binocular case just held two, binoc uh, two uh, hand grenades just right. And then you 
put your binoculars around your neck. And being a sniper, you always taught to shoot the one that looks most important, so you never want to look too important. So we kept the <laughs> kept the camouflage veil as a scarf to hide the binoculars. What had happened? A machine gun bullet had gone between me and the grenade and sheared the linkage off. That's why it come loose on it. So, I mean, you don't know how close you come. No. Even behind the lines, a few hundred yards away, you hear bullets. We were advancing. When we go into an attack, some people think, oh, get your gun, fellow. We've got to take that hill over there. That's not the way. There's always somebody in front of you. And we get the benefit of their patrolling and everything, and then we take over. And then, of course, we're doing patrolling until somebody goes through us. We're moving up. We're not under fire. We're moving up. There's a regiment in front of us. Uh, Jimmy Brown, <coughs> sergeant of some platoon, got a bullet right through the jug ravine. And I think, I, I don't know just what how the words were spelt, when the letter went home, but it's usually killed by a sniper. He wasn't killed by a sniper. He was killed by a spear bullet. Just, I mean, where do you draw the line between fate and luck? Yeah. Yeah. We had a, a sergeant, <clears throat> the name of, I think his name was Sergeant Weber. And we had a system called LOB, left of the battle. And if our platoon officer, the Sergeant C, are getting a little shaky, they just, well, you better get back and have a couple of weeks rest. So this happened to this, I think it was Sergeant Weber. And so he's given a jeep and a driver and he's sent back. Now I, I can count all the German airplanes in my whole year through Europe on them two hands. I have much problem with German planes. And then if one German plane didn't come over and strap him on his way to a rest area and kill both the, the driver and himself. So is that fate or luck? Well, that's fate, On, yeah. on D-Day, I never seen an airplane strap. I don't know why they didn't strap the beats and trying to help blow up mines, eh? And uh, this one Spitfire had come over firing, not not helping us. He was at the reinforcements farther inland, and we had these uh, landing craft that looked like I never got a good close look at them. About the size of a six-inch stovepipe. There's about four of these across and about 12 deep, so you can imagine how much firepower that is. But they're not adjustable. The, the commander's got the range finders, and when he gets to what this, the right distance, they let these, it's just a salvo go in the effort to break up the wire and everything. And this airplane had just come back and just come in line with that salvo, and all I seen was just little wee pieces coming down. It was the end of the war for him. The end of the war for him. Isn't yeah. that something? Isn't that something? Yeah. Bill, when you got into the regiment, and when you when you you did your training in, in uh, probably in the University of New Armories, maybe Camp Borden, you went to, did you go to Newfoundland? Were you in Newfoundland? No, I joined the Queen's Army and come back to Newfoundland. Oh, did you? Yeah, I, I had a, an uncle grew up with me. He's about four or five years older than me. He taught me how to play ball and lacrosse and hockey. We were very good friends. Uh, and the war opened in 39, and he moved to Toronto. He got married, and I used to hitchhike down to see him once in a while, and the war's open now, and this is the spring of 40. He says, Bill, what are, we, are you going to join the forces or what? He was better educated than I was. And so he says, let's see if we can get in the Air Force. I'm in Toronto. I'd hitchhike down to his house. So they would take him, but they wouldn't take me because I didn't have enough education. So he wouldn't go because I didn't go. So I thought, you know, I went back to hitchhike back to Brampton. And a lot of Queen's Own guys had joined the Queen's Own. So I backed, hitchhiked back to Toronto. Sorry, we're all filled up. <laughs> so I joined up in the Brampton armies and the Lawrence Scots to be with some of the guys. So after joining there, we go to Stanley Barracks in Toronto. We're doing parade ground stuff in our soft shoes. We had no uniforms or no guns or no nothing. <clears throat> then next thing we know, we ship us to Camp Borden, and we're automatically wearing a 48th Highlander badge. We had nothing to say about that. So in a way, when the Queens don't come back from Newfoundland, South East New Brunswick, I put in for a transfer to the to the Queens Zone, and so. I met them in Sussex, New Brunswick. Did you? 
Now, uh, to get to be a sniper, I just have to, they happened to have a, a rifle uh, competition, and uh, you had to pass this test before you can get a pass into St. John's, or most of the nearest the big city, I guess. So I, I had passed my test, and I'm instructing other people who hadn't passed their tests, because I'd already passed. And uh, one friend of mine, he, he couldn't see very good. I don't know how he got in the Army. Instead of me coaching him, I was shooting for him <laughs> so he'd get a pass. <laughs> so he got his pass, and we went away to St. John's for the weekend. <laughs> did you have uh, some experience with the rifles before this, or was it just something that you... Yes, yes, I did. I, I, I guess my dad later tried to get into the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. He's quite an outdoors man himself. I guess I was shooting a rifle. I had, luckily, I, my boyfriend's uh, parents lived in the country, and they had about 50 acres, an old barn on the building, so we're kind of free to show a little crick going through there, shooting frogs and uh, flying needles and all. Were they, were they, what, were they 22? Or oh, just 22? a little 22, single 22, shot yeah, 22, yeah, yeah. yeah. Even though um, being a sniper is, is, a, is an art, it's a skill that you well, don't, you, you, you either not, can do it or you can't. It's not, it's not your ability to shoot so much. There's no other terrain. Like when we advanced to say the Rhine River, where they blew the bridges up, yeah. the engineers would might send an officer ahead and meet one of our scouts to show them around the area where there might be a likely place to put in a Bailey Bridge. Did things like that, yeah. and uh, artillery. I. I uh, I don't know. Uh, I've heard people say they've, they had 30 kills or 100 kills. I don't know how many kills. Anything I shot at were too far away to know whether they got back up or not. Yeah. yeah. And besides, I told all my guys, shoot them in the belly. Don't try and shoot them like all, west, all quiet on the western front through the head. Threw them through to the belly, and when he gets screaming, he'll be taking two or three other guys out to carry them out. Yeah. That way you get three or four guys with one shot. Yeah. We don't want to. We don't want to kill everybody. We just want to win the war. <laughs> oh, that's one way to do it. <laughs> Good stuff. Bill, tell me about the um, incident with the the Hitler Youth troops who captured and killed some of the Queen's own. Well, I was at headquarters company. The snipers were at headquarters company. Traveling with headquarters company. And we were laying along a ditch alongside of the road. I think it was an old, a lot of the farmyard, courtyards are rock, stone, you know. And on the other side, the, where the troops went in, a D, D company, uh, it happened to be all, all wheats, all wheat fields. Well, see, they've been there for months and months, so they, they dug holes, they dig holes so it's tapered so a tank can drive down into the hole, and they know just the right depth, so it's just a turret sticking up. Then they camouflage all that. You can't, you can't tell until you're on top of them. And so that's what happened. When our, our tanks, I can't remember, it might have been a half a dozen tanks with our D company on top of them. And they're just driving through the wheat field. And on the back end of the wheat field was a forest, kind of a forest. And it wasn't until they got pretty close, they opened up fire and a couple of tanks went up and the other, I think they got about three tanks like, like that. And of course, the machine gun fire cleared the guys off the tanks. Those that weren't killed were, were if, most of them were all wounded. You know, when they spread that MG42, it fires so fast, it sounded like a motorbike going down the road. Because they carried their ammunition by vehicles. They could have a machine gun that spits things out like that sound of a motorbike. We couldn't, we had to carry all our shells. So every infantry man had these big square punches that hold four magazines for our gun that just goes pop, 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 because yeah. we had to carry the information. So that, uh, they opened up, and uh, I know one tank went right through the wall where we were laying along the ditch. I think there was somebody killed by, I, I'm not so sure of the name, so I won't say the name in case I'm wrong. It's quite a long time ago. Yeah. But uh, This was the second week in June? Is it June 11th? 11th of June, June I believe. 11th, yeah. Yeah. Long Asno Patri, I think, was the name of the, uh, so, the name of the town. Yeah, yeah. So the next day, uh, she Charlie Martin and Shep and I, another fellow too, four of us went uh, patrolling over the area we just got chased out of. 
when we found these bodies. Uh, and it appeared they're all in line, just like they were all behind each other trying to find a way out. And uh, like when we found them, uh, one guy I remember had, we have these little testaments, New Testaments in our pockets. One guy had, was reading that. They're all laying in line. Another guy had his bolt open like he was just going to shove one in and he didn't quite make it. Another one had the bolt open to indicate he had just fired a shot. All those kind of things and a bullet in every one of their heads. Mm -hmm. And Cranfield was one of them. Yeah, Cranfield was one of your sniper. Yeah, uh, he was players. one of the D Company snipers. Yeah. So you moved from France to Belgium to Holland across the Rhine into Germany? Yeah. Uh, on the way, we had to go take the Scheldt Pocket. Uh, the British take on the port of Antwerp, but the waterway leading to the ocean, the English Channel, I don't know, it might have been 20, 25 miles. So we couldn't use, we needed that port. And we got the port, but we can't use it because the Germans own all that land leading to it. And they had blown the dikes, and it was pretty. Really, that's where they got the name "water rats" because it was pretty. The only protection you had to keep dry was walking top of the dikes, and then you're dead if you do that. You had to walk kind of half in the water, so you're kind of countersunk. That was a that was a pretty tough, pretty tough go. I don't know why they just didn't blast the devil out of the whole thing and never never signed anybody in there. Yeah. But that took a lot of toll and it took a lot of time where we were able to get our boat stalled down through that waterway to, so we could, because now we're way up into, you know, if we're using the Boulogne, Calais, what's left of their ports, yeah. now we got to have some place closer. Yeah. So it was important that we took that. So that was quite a big battle there. So, so then we went on into Belgium. I don't recall a heck of a lot of trouble in Belgium. And then the Holland was the ones that were really hurt because they were the last ones to be liberated. And they, the Germans had taken, they, they had just robbed their country. It was, it was, I, I was holed up in Nijmegen. I was with the Queen's Own, the Eighth Brigade were with those who uh, broke through to relieve the, I think it was the, uh, the American 82nd Airborne Division who took uh, Nijmegen. So we were holed up there in the fall of 44 for, for a few months. We take turns uh, down guarding the, the shoreline because uh, they, own, they own upstream from the Rhine and anything that would float they would wire bombs to the side of them and put them afloat on the hopes that they would hit one of the piers holding the bridge up because we had the paratroopers had saved the bridge. But we got, now we're guarding the bridge. We're not over the water. We're still on our side. And so uh, when we see one, we just have to paddle out in our boat and kind of steer it around the pilings until it got past. And then we don't care where it went after that. <laughs> you, um, in Holland, you were received with uh, great excitement by the, by the population. Oh, well, we're still. I. I Two or three times a year, I'm talking to people in Holland from the happy memories. Uh, uh, their first, their 50th anniversary, the, the, they opened their their country up to, for their liberators. All us, all Canadians, say, if you ever go, any of you young fellows ever go to uh, to Holland, make sure you got a big maple leaf on your shirt, and you'll be with, with, with kindness. That's for sure. I remember very well. I was there in uh, but, in. Uh, for the 50th in, yeah. in Holland. It was a great experience. Well, my host, uh, he, uh, I guess they asked for volunteers to put up soldiers. And so this fellow, Ambers, the name, Charles Ambers, Marja, got my name. So I get a letter from him. And uh, he, he's only 36 years old or something at that time. And he was just a little baby when the war was, was uh, declared. And uh, he said, you may wonder why a guy so young wants to put you up for while well, your stay here. He says, anybody had <coughs> risked their life to give us a free country who wanted to do something for them. So <coughs> we arrived. We arrived at the meeting point. <coughs> called it Maple Leaf One or something. <laughs> yeah. 
And that's where we congregated and we met our host. So he drives us to their house and they lived in a townhouse section, like about six units together. And each, each townhouse had a rope going out to the local uh, light. Maple leaf flags flying all over the place. And going up the sidewalk into his house was Mr. Betridge, our liberator, and stuff like that. And so once we got settled in there, we're phoning around to talk to each other. And when they phoned my house, where I stayed, they, they'd ask for Boots, which was my nickname. So one day he says, where'd you get the name Boots? And I said, well, they didn't have Boots to fit me, and I, they put me, I put me in the kitchen as a helper serving food to the guys doing their 30 miles. We had to, we had to be able to walk 30 miles in 10 hours. Whenever we weren't guarding the shores in England, we were always within one day's march so we could be there in, one, in, in 10 hours. So uh, I explained uh, about the boots. I got some pictures of uh, me serving food to the guys. That's where I got my nickname, Boots. <laughs> Only it was a boot with a few, worse, few swear words in between there because I, I'm not marching. Yeah. Only two weeks without any boots. So anyway, when the, the host found out that was my nickname, he hoisted down his Dutch flag. He wore a pair of army boots and set of mess tins and hoisted them up beside the flag. <laughs> <laughs> a, bit of, a bit of humor. Yeah. When you uh, when you moved into Germany, however, it was a different story, was it not? The, the, the populace was was very uh, very yeah. suspicious and very. We uh, we were pretty reckless with their furniture, but we didn't do no harm. We were we were, we were told and told treat them strict, but with respect. That's what we did. In this case, uh, I can't remember the little town. It was, kind of a funny name on the outskirts of uh, the, the port of Emden in the North Sea in, in Germany. And uh, when we lived in homes, we were given a street to put our soldiers up in, and I had 30 guys in my platoon, so I had to find space for 30 people, 20 scouts and 10 snipers. So knock on the door. No answer, knock again, no answer. Well, there's nobody here, so we walk in and think we got the place all to ourselves. Well, I heard a little whimper in, just in, in one of the bedrooms we were checking out. And so I took all my equipment off and I gave it to Chris, my shepherd's been wounded by this time. I got a new sniping partner now, Chris. And uh, Chris, take, get out of here. So I walked around the bed and kneeled down and I knew the German word for uh, slopping, or sleeping was slopping. So I got the lady in there with just, just a trembling, just a trembling, a little, little girl, I don't know, five or, pretty young, five or six years old. I don't know how come they didn't get away with the rest of the people. Got caught short somehow. So I got down my knees and I could see I didn't have no weapons of any kind. And I said, we, we just want slopping. It's okay, it's okay. And she settled down and finally came out from the bed and she had this little girl with her. So she was quite relieved because the horrible sword stories that they've been told by the Germans about rape and killing and stuff, they're just, just scared to death. So when they found that we're not going to harm them, they led us to another bedroom and she took some blankets out and nice white sheets. We thought, gee, we're going to have white sheets, Chris. So then she left and said, said, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So we're just getting kind of ready, taking our equipment off and, and knock them on the door. We open the door and there's that little girl with a bouquet of flowers. I, I, I can't forget that. It's uh, been on my mind ever since we left Germany. The, the, the shame, the sin, the horrors of war to do that to people. Yeah, pretty tough, pretty tough. Well, in, the war was over fairly soon after that. Uh, on May the 6th, your birthday, how old were you then? What birthday would that be? I, I'd be, that was the year of the end of the war, so I'd be 24 years old. Yeah. I, I've been in the Army six years, yeah. four of it in England, yeah. a year in Canada, and a year in Europe. Yeah. How long before you got back to Canada? I had the war over May the 6th for us. I didn't get home till uh, November. Okay. So. 
parade ground stuff. The war is over. We want to get home, but the ports are, are mined. They got to clear the men and their parade ground stuff and stuff like that. Hartnell was our RSM. He, 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 he said, "Better to get a hold of your men." I mean, we got German pistols and American forty-five hanging down by our side. We look like a bunch of desperados. He, he said, "We get nothing but good news about what you're doing up front. You come back here, you act like a bunch of bums." He says. <laughs> this is the RSM. Yeah. Yeah. Hartnell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so when you got home, what happened to you? Were you did you get Were you married before you went overseas or not? No, well, you were uh, too young, I guess. When I left to go overseas, my grandmother gave me an address of some relative of hers. So I'm walking down the street on my first leave in London, England. They, they lived on the outskirts of London. So I found these people, and the, the girl, <coughs> they had a, a, a two daughters and, a, and a, these people that my grandmother sent me, two, two daughters and a, and a son. The son was only about 15, but he's so big. I could wear his civvy clothes when I went out at nights when I was visiting them. He's a big, great, big guy. So, uh, no, I never got married. Uh, uh, later, I found that a lot of guys that got married over there went home with a leg missing or an arm missing. I didn't want to get into any of that, so I, I got my discharge and come home, and I brought her over after the war and married her. She's about three years younger than I was. Okay. So, I took a friend... Hurt? Took a friend down for, we could sneak away, eh? Yeah. Because with knowledge of maps and compass, we had to, when we were locked in down at Portsmouth, a, 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 an abandoned military base, we were put in that base. How the German didn't see the buildup of three divisions of vehicles, tanks, and trucks preparing, preparing to go over here? How we got away with that? I'll, I can tell you a story about that afterwards. I keep getting, I get off the subject now. Uh, no, you're okay. You were talking about the, about your girlfriend in London, and then you went into the imp, into the yeah, uh, well, impound, yeah. I guess, at the in Portsmouth before you got on the boats to go over the channel, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I uh, I got home and <clears throat> most of the guys were all married, and people people have asked me why did I join the army. If I was American, I, I said this on an interview I've done sometime. I don't think the Americans would like it too much. But I was asked, why did I join the Army? And I said, on, over on TV, I said, if I was American, I would say I joined to fight for my country. But I'm a Canadian. I joined because everybody else has joined. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> so what did you do in your peacetime life? I, my dad was an old tinsmith. There's no oil burners or gas burners them days. All new stovepipes in the fall, and I had a letter from him just before we crossed the Rhine River. Asked me if I'd thought of what I was going to do when I get out of the army, and he was thinking of starting up a tinsmithing business. So I wrote back and said, "Yes, yeah, that'd be fine. I'd join that." And as we were, as they were. Getting, as we were getting so annoyed about not getting home right away, they made courses available. And I, I was so used to country, like sniping, sneaking around, and maps and compasses. I know where the little hills are. I know all the, all the things that help me keep living. So I put in for a, tour, uh, a course there running for outfitters, which is a, like a guide up north. And I thought that would suit me fine, but it was filled up and I couldn't get in. There was another one available for welding. And I thought, well, welding, that goes with sheet metal. I didn't know sheet metal, you can't weld sheet metal, it would blow <laughs> up. I took a welding course and I come home with a diploma written in Dutch. So I started in business with my dad, William A. Betridge and son. It was all eighth trough and stovepipe some days. No gas, no oil yet. Yeah, that's in 40, 45. 45 we started. So, uh, we couldn't buy steel. We are buying rolls of aluminum, like the butcher had that butcher's paper. If you used to wrap your meat up, well, we bought aluminum rolls, and we used that for, for making duck work. Couldn't buy steel. So uh, Dad, he's drinking a little bit heavy. He never lost a day's work, but on the weekend, that case of beer come home, and that was his weekend, was his case of beer. <laughs> and so I got fed up, and I had this diploma 
written in Dutch, electric glass, and they call it. And I learned to be a good welder, but only f from them setting the machine at the right heat. We couldn't understand the language, so we didn't know why they did this. But once they set the heat, it wasn't too hard to, to weld. Eh? So I took the diploma and I went down to an ant state in Toronto and I went around and I got a job with this diploma, electric glass, and written in Dutch. They couldn't even understand the language in here. And I got a job in uh, W.D. Beef and Son uh, welding up like you might be in the gravel business. You want a snowplow added to your truck? And I, I did that kind of welding. And my wife, my girlfriend, wasn't home, wasn't back from England yet. It took almost a year and a half before she got over here. So uh, I, I worked on that job until I had word she's coming. So then I went back to, to uh, Brampton again. And uh, my dad was a, a lead hand in the Evro uh, airplane factory during the war. He made, made good money. They made good money to help start a business. And I had a thousand dollars reestablishment credit from overseas service. So uh, we, I started buying machinery. We mounted them in the workbenches down in the cellar and sh showed me how to use them. And uh, we went into business. And after that certain time, uh, I got fed up and and uh, quit Dad. I remember the money that I put in tools and stuff to give me my share of the money. He gave me a 1935 Chev <laughs> and a, a furnace for the house I was refitting. I brought a building out of an old army camp and I'm refitting this building. He gave me a furnace for that and all the eaves off and stuff for my fare of the business. And then he went to, to Malton and he so he got a, he put him back in the lead hand and he phoned me, he said, Bill, would you like to run the business for me? I, I got a chance to go back to Malton. And I said, yeah, I'll think about it, Dad. And my brother was in, he was in the Air Force, but he was too young to be overseas. He, uh, after a day's training, he was a fine instructor in, Mal in Brampton. They go into Toronto to some favorite restaurant and coming home, he got in an accident going around the Bendigar, crisscross him and he broke his neck. So he was very well educated, and I talked to him, and uh, he had this cast all, this was both the eyes open, the hair all sticking out through his hair. I remember the hydro cut his, his hydro, and I, I was going to shoot the whole damn department up for that, after what he went through. So anyway, I talked to him about this, and he said, well, why don't you, why don't you buy it? And I said, I, 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 I don't know nothing about the bookkeeping and that. And I said, well, you come in with me. He says, well, I don't have any money. I said, I don't think we need much money. So many dollars a month and thing. And so we made a deal with Dad. And I can't remember the amount of money, but we paid him so much a month. And uh, so him and I are on our own. So first thing we know, he gets a, a call to the Toronto flying field as a flying instructor down there. Now, now <laughs> he doesn't know what to do. Stay with the Brampton Sheet Metal Limited. Oh, it wasn't limited at that time or take the flying job, of course. I said, whatever you say, Albert, whatever you want to do is okay with me. So he thought about it and he said, I think I'll take the flying instructor's course. He says, it didn't cost me nothing to be a partner of yours, so it don't cost you nothing for me to leave you. And so I'd be about 46 or 47 when like I ran the visit myself. Uh, I, I worked at it for 35 years and then my oldest boy took it over. I had three boys, no girls, and uh, the, they were spaced quite a bit apart. The other two boys were not old enough to work yet, still going to school. So after they got their education, as it stands now, uh, my son, uh, I was quite a serviceman. I serviced uh, gas and oil. I had really, really well thought of in the service business. My biggest fear was going out in the middle of the night with not have what I need to fix what the trouble is. So anyway, when I sold the business to my oldest boy, he said, Dad, you might as well take all that service stuff home because I'm not getting into the service business. So right now, he's in the biggest service businesses in Canada <laughs> through the reputation I left behind. Yeah. He's got a direct energy contract. He services things from Brampton up to North East Shelburne, Orange all over to Dundalk, Bolton. All. He's got 12 service trucks with computers and, every, and panel trucks full of parts and everyone. 
He's got, I think it's four or five big cube vans really? with machinery and everything in. They got their own pipe threading with stuff and all that. Big bending machine so they can make things on the job. I'm millionaire now. I should have stayed in a little bit longer. <laughs> it shares in the company. Yeah. Well, let me ask you about your girlfriend. What was her name? Amy. Amy. A-M-Y. Is Amy still your wife? She's still with us? No, she passed away the last day of March, not very long ago. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Sorry to hear that. Yeah. 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 So, you you go back to France a lot, I guess, or I've not been a lot, back, but often, yeah. I've been back quite a bit. Uh, did you ever, presumably you fly into Paris or someplace, did you ever cross from Britain across the Channel again? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a... Uh, a college in Aurora that, for, I don't know, maybe for a reward for good work, they, about 20 kids are given a free trip over there. And this one year, they wanted a veteran to travel with them. They phoned and the, 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 air, the people who does the booking phoned me and asked me if I'd like to attend with them. I was paying, paying all my way. And I said, well, sure. So there we got in a, we arrived at Heathrow in England. Uh, late when we got in, <coughs> had to get up early in the morning. In the meantime, he had connections over there, the guy that did the, that was a documentary I'm, I'm doing. And uh, he had arranged for a, a panel truck, and the driver is the guy who had sound equipment, the guy that holds the big wand over your head. And then we had to get up real early in the morning and travel down to the south of England to get the ferry. Yeah. So we drove across the ferry right over to the southeastern bottom of the where the Americans landed. We were nowhere as near where we landed. No, no. It's no wonder they got a big funeral, big, uh, big cemetery over there. When I look at them cliffs, them guys had to come this up. This is Omaha Beach, yeah. 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 Why they ever picked that to land, I'll never know. I'll yeah. never know. Because... The the cliff line, I don't know how far it is, hundreds and hundreds of yards. They must have excavated all the earth away and they poured bunkers. Oh, hundreds and hundreds of yards by the whole the whole front of their front. And then they filled it up. They got their radios down there. They got their range finder. They got, I got a picture of me uh, looking into one. It looked like about a six inch stove pipe, probably, probably a meter and a half wide. And they're they're attacking the 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 big battleships, blasting blasting. They're taking their range and phoning them back to their artillery. Yeah. They had their underground armories down there. They had they had everything down there. And of course, they covered that all in with dirt and threw grass, and you can't see it. No. It's just the on manhole leading down to them. Yeah. Talk about organized. But. Their, their cemeteries are like putting greens, well, like ours are in England. Yeah. You know, just like putting greens, the people look after them. Well, there's a war, war grave society. And uh, once every five years, the, uh, the Canadian government sent a, an envoy over there in a token of appreciation for the way they look after our, our war graves. And uh, I was on one of those trips. It didn't cost me anything. It's another government trip just to France, to yeah. France. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's just beautiful. Uh, and, you know, when we're doing a ceremony, when, when we go on a free trip, we try and visit usually five or six cemeteries and put wreaths down in a little rigmarole, you know. Mm -hmm. And the little girls and boys have picked up their little wildflowers along the road and they're yeah. waiting until we get finished and then they all run up and put their little flowers down. Yeah. Some of the girls, they, they might recognize the names similar to their Uncle Jack or something, and they'll claim that as their little home. Really? And they make sure the weed that's weeded and they look after yeah, it. Yeah, nice. pre they appreciate their liberation. They, I tell well, you. they do. Oh. They do. Okay, let's talk about your uh, D-Day crossing of the channel. Tell us a little bit about what happened uh, on D-Day. Door went down. What happened? I, I should have brought a picture. I could... I don't know whether it show up on camera or not, but I got a picture of the wall, and even myself. Well, first of all, the sea was so rough, 
I guess I'd say, guess about, we're downwind about 300 yards. B Company landed where we were supposed to. And we're a bit lucky there because they got a lot more trouble. They landed right in front of the bunker. But Which was your company? Uh, a company. A company. A and B hit the shore. Okay. C and D were in reserve, yeah. and of course support and headquarters were still. That's what uh, the last guy, he was in the support company, yeah. so he, we had to clear the beach before them guys got in there. Uh, so anyway, we're all on our own. We had sand tables set up about the size of a large pool table in England, and every morning each platoon met with the intelligent people. It's like you being out fishing on Wasego Beach and you pull your boat up and shore. It's about the same scenery. You've got cabins and cottages along the shoreline. But the intelligence people say, well, this one, we know there's a machine gun and a cannon in there. It's an MG-42, that fast-firing one. And they're telling us what's about, and the what's oh, reinforced wind inside with concrete and all that stuff. And they're giving us all this information. The next day we go back and have another meeting with the intelligent people. Well, they've taken one gun out of there and they've said, here I thought, this is going to be a snap. This is going to be the easiest thing in the world. Well, did I ever get fooled? We didn't land on the beach, first of all. Well, I knew exactly what we had to do, but we didn't land where we were supposed to land. So we're all on our own. We're just all on our own. So your first impact is get up to the wall for protection. That's a big mistake. The bunker that I'm supposed to shoot into, I never seen till the first anniversary, 40 years later. I never seen it till I went back 40 years later. The, the opening is so the guns are shooting along the wall. So you're not safe when you got the wall at all. They, they've anticipated that. And they just pour the machine gun fire down there in their cannons. Now in training, Tanks had two big axles sticking out with a thing the size of a 45-gallon drum, a big drum, with chains, like big logging chains, and they rotate with the drum and pound the devil out of the sand in an effort to blow mines up. Yeah. And then they're supposed to get to the wall. This is in training. This is in training. Up in Scotland, we did this. They're supposed to jump out of the tanks, and they have what they call a sticky bomb. You peel the coating off and whack it against the wall and you got about six seconds to get back in the tank because it's going to blow a hole through the wall. Well, some hope they'd have with the machine gun and the cannon parallel with the beast. Yeah. I didn't know that for 40 years later. But on each side of that, like they can't see who's coming in from the sea this, except four feet of concrete unless you're 100 yards off the one way but to the left of that bunker and to the right of that bunker is like a manhole with a machine gun that protecting the people in the, in the bunker, you see? Mm -hmm. So they're not worried. Nobody's going to get up the guys with me machine gun on each side of them. Mm -hmm. I got pictures of that. So uh, <laughs> we're all on our own. We just, uh, I, 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 the, the wall, the sea wall was a cement curved wall. I don't think it was more four or five feet high. I guess the effort to blow the waves to come back out again. When the Germans welded, they, they fastened pipe to, the, to that. And then they, I talked later one one of my visits to a, a guy, he's 50 or 60 years old now, but he was a teenager, and the Germans made the teenagers string the wire across the pegs and that. To uh, Anyway, whether a lucky shell hit that wire or not, I leaped over that fence in one, one leap with a gun in my hand and a handful of ammunition. I don't remember too much about it. I'm only worried about that f much space because my old pal Jack over to my right, low Harry, he on my left, I only had to worry about that piece of land between me and that wall. Little did I know I wouldn't have been safe at the wall un until that machine gun knocked out. Then, then they got up and threw grenades in the bunker. Yeah. Yeah. That all happened pretty quick. I guess so. In fact, I would bet when the guy got on that, took over that manhole I tell you about, when he seen what was out there in daylight, I'll bet he took off. If he's smart, he would have took off and he'd seen nothing but battleships in that fire over there. If he was smart. So that left the bunker immune to our guys running up through grenades at B Company. Quite an experience. Yeah. Do you, uh, do you expect to go back? 
again? Have you got other plans? Or? I don't know. I, uh, <clears throat> Next year, I want to get into my health. I've got a bit of a problem with the nannerism. It's getting close to giving me problems. And uh, I got a meeting with the specialist later this week to see whether I should try to operate. He suggests that I might be a little too old. It's a four hour operation. Yeah. Yeah. How so old are you I'm now, Bill? A, I'm a little undecided. <laughs> I'm 87. My dad and his two brothers never got to be 90. So my common sense, which I use a lot of over there, you don't you don't get the guy say, "Hey, Harry, let's see if we got a Victoria Cross today." <laughs> that, that don't happen. No. It's that you come under extreme conditions that you got to make a, a decision in a second. You got no my, no time to change your mind. That's the guy that wins the Victoria Cross. Yeah. He might make the right decision or he might make the wrong decision. Yeah.